my name is Phil McManus. I'm a geographer in the School of Geoscience at the University of Sydney. I uh, specialise in human geography, particularly urban and environmental geography. Um, my presentation is about uh, climate change and the coast and the link between urban and environmental issues. I'm uh, particularly interested in what happens to when climate change, anthropogenic climate change, builds upon other existing issues such as flooding, storm surge, sea level rise and drainage issues around local areas. So my presentation talks about this in the Sydney example and a draw upon historical material to look at what had happened with other uh, moves in Sydney in the past and also around surrounding areas, particularly Lake Macquarie, about equity issues, about procedural justice and fairness issues, which um, are all part of climate justice issues in relation to urban development and how we'd like to address climate change issues now and for the future. Okay, um, thank you very much everybody. I'd just like to start off by saying that the talk this afternoon I think intersects with a few of the talks this morning. Um, talks about uh, the coastline, the change in coastline and the, um, the scientific evidence around climate change. And so I'm not going to cover some of those things in the talk. I'm also not going to cover some of the um, longer term change sort of stuff before human memory we're relying upon say physical science, geological science, etc. Um, but the talk definitely does build on those sort of things. So, um, Beach Road, Dulwich Hill, planning urban infrastructure in an age of anthropogenic climate change. Hopefully the various uh, terms in the talk will come evidence we move through. So the first thing is about establishing baselines and there's obviously been a lot of work here about the history and that we have trouble establishing baselines and it's not quite clear and it's perhaps um, we have short term memory about uh, what's gone in the past and forgetting about the baselines. Um, I think there's also a few other issues here and the key point is it's not simply a matter of better science. If it was simply a matter of better science, we'd probably be done doing it by now and if we didn't actually complete it, we would know what to do. We would know that we need perhaps a bigger machine that goes ping or more funding into this area of research in order to make it work. But usually you find people say, well we know the science, we just can't implement it, we can't get the social stuff, we can't get the cultural things working. So the paper here is to try and bring this together. Um, it's not to say that the science is uh, completely uh, perfect, it's not, uh, not there at the moment. Um, it can be developed further, but what's the point in developing science for its own sake if it's not actually resonating with anybody? So there's, uh, I think, a gap uh, between the popular perceptions and the scientific research. Uh, they're not in alignment at the moment, and I'll go through some of the issues there. There's also an assumption of a unidirectional flow, I think, and I hope I'll show you that uh, in the presentation in terms of the way in which climate change, the coast, working the, that relationship between the coast and the land, and I think there's big issues there. And also think that equity issues um, are tend to limit the discussion, uh, they're limiting the planning options and climate change adaptation policy, and the solution is not to get rid of equity issues. I think they're paramount and it's a way to work out ways to engage with those particular issues. So I'll take you through some examples of that. Um, you may recognise some of these images. The first one's um, an album from uh, Australian rock band Midnight Oil, um, whose lead singer then went on to become the Minister for the Environment and Culture, amongst other things, um, and had a, a coastal seat in Sydney, Kingsford Smith. Um, so it's uh, Red Sails and Sunset Midnight Oil, and you can see the Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Opera House there. Iconic features, but no water in Sydney Harbour. The one on the right hand side is from the Powerhouse Museum's Ecologic and that's modelling a 10 metre rise in sea level at Circular Quay with the Opera House again. So um, you can see that the, get this clear, uh, the Circular Quay, the ferry terminals are gone and there's water back into the city, if I can find it, water back into the city buildings as well behind it and the Opera House down the foreground is um, above water but uh, not entirely. So there are certain cultural images I think do, um, you know, I guess, influence the way in which we might perceive and the iconic features are part of them. Uh, we're not the only country that does that. Here's images from the United Kingdom. Uh, the Thames Barrier um, is an existing structure um, east of uh, London and it's preventing uh, flooding on the Thames and you can see here again around uh, uh, Parliament House and Big Ben and all the other uh, Westminster Cathedral what would happen if we didn't have these structures. So there's a, a discursive, um, I guess, sort of a discursive side to this in terms of the image, the power of the image, what it's resonating with, and there's a materiality in terms of an economic cost that what would happen if flooding did occur, if we did have sea level rise or storm surge. Um, it's not the entire story, but you can see these sort of projections 
um, and the way in which they're represented, the way in which people uh, receive these in terms of the media. Now, obviously, people can relate to that in different ways. They don't necessarily receive it the same way, but that's what's being produced. Um, and it's the same in Sydney. I'll just take you through a couple of more recent examples. Uh, this was in the Sydney Morning Herald um, in 2008, and it shows Manly, um, and the Manly existing up there today. So you know, we don't know, for example, when they say today in 2008, what did it look like 50 years earlier, 100 years earlier? And I think Caroline's paper this morning was really good at pointing that out. Um, but the idea of what it would look like in 2050, um, fairly simple, raise the water level a certain way. Um, I think a certain uh, amount. And I think that's part of the picture, but I also think it's not the entire picture, which I'll come on to afterwards. Um, various suburbs, this is in 2010, the Sydney Morning Herald again, um, talking about what's like to happen in Sydney. So what is happening is they're taking often international um, measurements about sea level rise, average sea level rise throughout the planet, and then applying that logic in Sydney. And that might not be you know, the right amount to use. The amounts might be different. So the Sydney suburbs facing significant danger of inundation, even with limited rises, and they mention a few of the suburbs there. And they're probably some of the suburbs that if anybody knows Sydney, you'd expect. But also other nearby areas, um, significant parts of Newcastle, which is a city to the north of Sydney and the second largest city in New South Wales, seventh largest in Australia. Um, and the Central Coast, which is the area between um, Sydney and Newcastle, um, going up you know, places like uh, Gosford and up towards Lake Macquarie and then to Newcastle. But the problems associated with rising sea levels are not limited to coastal areas. So there's some recognition here that it goes back from the coast. It goes into the catchment areas uh, along the Parramatta River. So it's about low-lying areas, um, threatening homes and infrastructure, and some of the suburbs given here. Homebush Bay, Newington and Silverwater. And for those of you who know Sydney, they're areas that are um, slightly lower socioeconomic status in some ways compared to the uh, coastal areas. New housing in some of those areas. Um, Silverwater has a prison amongst other things. Homebush Bay has Olympic facilities. So there's a lot of other, apart from residential infrastructure, that is likely to be flooded if that <coughs> in indeed does come true. And the image is a map of Sydney with a man swimming in uh, Manly Dam. This is a very recent one, um, it's in September, end of September this year, and it's a res response to the IPCC's recent report. And the case here is an 80 centimetre rise in sea levels. I've put the, um, the colour in to highlight something. Uh, that high tides would regularly flood parts of many Sydney suburbs that are close to water. So they're not just saying coastal suburbs, and some of those suburbs there, Annandale for example, Marrickville, are not suburbs that are on the coast. They are suburbs that are perhaps low-lying, they're in uh, on Sydney Harbour or they're in areas where the uh, Cooks River is susceptible to flooding of some kind. But um, similar, I haven't got an image for this one, um, similar to the Manly example, Bondi Beach will shrink to a thin ribbon of sand and extreme storm surges would reach the top of its concrete walls. So all the sort of past knowledge about what do we, when we built the concrete wall, uh, sea wall, and tried to establish what, what is the appropriate height for the sea wall, where to place it, all those sort of things, are based upon previous understandings as much as implied threat, but they don't take into account the push of climate change as well. So um, sea level rise uh, could be expected to be up to 80 centimetres higher by the end of the century. Uh, we're talking roughly in about uh, 85 years' time. Um, but there's a concern. Infrastructure, once you start building, whether it's a residential infrastructure like a house, you can expect reasonably that it lasts for 25 years, but often a lot older. I mean, think of your own houses, you know, 50 years, maybe 100 years. Um, and some of this other infrastructure, um, if it's got a heritage value, it lasts for a lot longer time. So what we're doing now is really significant, and that works in many ways. It works in terms of energy conservation, and the way we're designing our houses, the way we're orientating our houses, all those sort of things. But it's also where we're positioning our houses and our, also our uh, cultural infrastructure in relation to you know, vulnerable positions uh, that could result from, and like to result from climate change. So we have the bottom here, the, the bottom part looks like it's just been cut off. Uh, Bondi Beach is iconic, it pulls in 1.8 uh, million visitors a year, um, and they're going to do a new development on it. Uh, $7 million North Bondi Surf uh, Life Saving Clubhouse, but one of the uh, politicians, New South Wales, I remember, uh, Member of the New South Wales Parliament, David Shoebridge for the Greens, said the council's um, own research which shows that Bondi Beach is set to recede dramatically, and that should be, I think, by about 20 um, metres and 45 metres in 20 metres in 2050, 45 metres in 2100. The sighting of this facility here, according to David Shoebridge, ignores those own plans. So 
Yes, this is uh, current 2013, but that facility, you'd imagine, is going to be here in perhaps 2050. What will it look like by that stage? Where will it be positioned in relation to the, the amount of beach? Not taking into account things like storm surges and other ways in which that piece of infrastructure could be vulnerable. Um, at the same time this happened, there was uh, the sea level rise by more than 80 centimetres. So uh, bad news for Bondi, which um, if you're over this way, you're in Bondi at the coast here. Um, and Ashfield, which is in that, just a little bit further in here, and your Dulwich Hill, for all the Dulwich Hill fans in the audience. Um, at, at last, the sign for Beach Road, Dulwich Hill, will mean what it says. Now, Dulwich Hill is 13 kilometres in from the coast. You can see, where, I'll point out where Beach Road, Dulwich Hill is. Um, it's nowhere near the beach. Um, funny if it wasn't tragic. Okay, can you imagine all that area? I mean, that's a, not likely to flood with an 80 centimetre rise. Uh, but imagine some of the other projections, the 10 metre sea level rise, um, some of those low lying areas, Sydney Airport for example, uh, the city centre area, some of these other suburbs here, coastal suburbs, would be in a lot more trouble before Dulwich Hill ends up being flooded. So as um, the letter to the editor Don Smith from Ashfield pointed out, uh, funny if it wasn't tragic. Is it likely to change behaviour? Well, not in a hurry. Um, we have seen an example of change behaviour in Sydney before around the harbour, and I've just shown this image here. It's pulling up one of the um, I think three midget submarines, Japanese submarines in World War II that entered or tried to enter Sydney Harbour, um, and they did sink some shipping in Sydney Harbour. And there was a change in behaviour in that house prices near Sydney Harbour and some of the eastern suburbs actually fell during the war as people moved out of Sydney, away from Sydney, because of the danger. And it wasn't obviously publicised very much. They didn't want to cause alarm and panic. Um, but people did move to the Blue Mountains and house prices went up in the Blue Mountains. So people did respond to a threat in a particular time. But the threat was sudden and a lot of unknown. Uh, climate change, I think, is not likely to occur in the same way. And if the climate change scenario does result in any sort of movement out, it will certainly be a lot slower than what we saw in the World War II example. Uh, what we're more likely to see, I think, is what was actually happening at the moment, um, or in the previous Labor government at the federal level. Um, this is our, our cities, our future in 2011. And it's about mitigation and adaptation. And it's to climate change generally. And it's thinking about not just um, what happens on the coast, but also something else which is obviously very important, which is bushfire risk. And we've had examples in Sydney very recently in the Blue Mountains uh, with the problems of bushfire, the expanding cities sort of blowing up like a balloon in terms of the amount of uh, urban bush interface and getting into areas which are really hard to fight fires. So there's a whole risk of bushfire, um, st uh, storm surge, sea level rise. They're recognised in the existing, uh, existing literature. And a few details here. Uh, between 26 and 33,000 kilometres of road um, is at risk in terms of the, throughout Australia, at risk on sea level rise. And that sea level rise, you can see the figures here, based upon 1.1 metres rather than 80 centimetres, uh, which was the earlier IPCC uh, projection. Uh, when you model that, you get you know, things like between um, 1,200 and 1,500 kilometres of rail, up to 8,600 commercial buildings, industrial buildings. But it varies throughout Australia. It varies significantly between states and depending upon what you're looking at. And I'll show you a few examples in a minute. But interestingly, Queensland and South Australia were the states with the greatest overall potential loss. That's the aggregate. But there were significant variations between states and between places within states. It's important to remember. Um, this is the combined replacement value. And you can see what it's composed of in terms of light, um, light industrial, uh, the commercial, the residential, and the road and rail. Um, and it, the various projections, the low projection and the high projection. Um, and yeah, it's pretty much, uh, like I said earlier, South Australia and Queensland having overall the total uh, highest in that area. But if we look at particular cases, um, you can see that it varies depending upon which scenario you introduce. So there is a degree of uncertainty here. And I take the point that Alistair made before. Uh, there is a certain degree of uh, pretty much certainty that we're locked into unavoidable uh, climate change of uh, rising temperatures. Um, but beyond that, it's a matter of you know, the, um, even the lower, if you take the lower scenarios here um, and the various scenarios, it's still pretty high. Okay, so that would be the, the sort of good news scenarios. Um, there's nothing that's down at zero. They're all, you know, the closest you're getting is over here um, for you know, small impact in places like uh, Tasmania. But obviously relative to the size of infrastructure, etc., it's probably significant in Tasmania as well. 
Uh, commercial buildings, um, I'm just going to point out here the Lake Macquarie with the arrow on the left hand side. Um, it's not residential buildings, but I'll come back to that later in the talk when I talk about um, some good work that we've been doing in Lake Macquarie. And you can see places like Wollongong, Newcastle are some of the suburbs, are some of the areas, more so than Sydney, where we are, uh, have significant amounts of infrastructure under threat. Perhaps ironically, over on this side here with the rail infrastructure, uh, Newcastle, Wollongong, quite a lot of that's to do with um, the port, the coal ports and um, the coal being exported, which goes off to places like Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, um, lesser extent China and India, um, and is burned in um, you know, furnaces for generating electricity and contributes to climate change. So there seems to be a sort of ironic, I guess, loop coming back here that those are the sites that are most vulnerable in terms of infrastructure. But let's try and put this into some sort of perspective again internationally. And people have talked about um, other places, developing countries and future generations. Um, here's an image of Mumbai. And you can see there's obviously a lot more people immediately affected. Um, you can see you know, some of the images, the water here and the boats and everything. That it's actually uh, that the point about visibility, storm surge, um, sea level rise is going to affect these sort of places. So. Uh, the low elevation coastal zone um, in India, there's roughly 60 um, million people, I think it is, in that, that area. Uh, in Bangladesh, it's, okay. in Bangladesh um, there's obviously a lot more people, so it's about, so about the same people, but a higher proportion of the population living in the same sort of area. We don't have that same sort of problems in Australia. The other point that you can't see here is that the drainage system in a place like Mumbai, when the British engineers did it, they only did it for formal settlements. They didn't do it for informal settlements. So a lot of the people with what we in uh, commons call slums don't have drainage. So a lot of the issue is not what you see, it's what you don't see, and it's about drainage issues and the, other, the directional flow when you uh, get water coming in um, from places where there's really obviously low coping mechanisms. And sorry, the quality of the slides are not quite so high. So some of the initial issues we like to get are more mundane than rising sea levels flooding the iconic structures I showed you early in the talk, and they're more inequitable than the flooding of the wealthier coastal suburbs and the, these iconic structures. I just want to quickly go through the last five minutes, an example from Lake Macquarie, some work we're doing on. Uh, at the moment it's um, being revised for a publication. Um, you can see that I won't spend too much time reading it. Lake Macquarie is the um, largest city in the Hunter region about 200,000 residents, and the council's known it's been vulnerable to sea level rise for a long time. It's where the predictions for future are, though, increased frequency of extreme storm events, and the council's been amongst the forefront of councils, local government councils, in adopting a sea level rise policy. Um, you can see for those on, you know, not sure, for me, uh, Sydney's just down here, and Lake Macquarie to the north, um, I've deliberately chosen a map here which doesn't have the suburbs named on it in the areas, because I'm trying to be, keep the suburbs anonymous. But uh, this is Lake Macquarie in here, and there's an outlet through to the ocean on this side. So north you have Newcastle, and you have other local governments down to the south. So we have an area low lying with um, the largest uh, freshwater lake inside there. Um, the community work we did involved five techniques. I won't go through them all. Um, the two localities where the questionnaire was conducted, and I'm only using two of these techniques today, uh, were low lying, uh, flood prone areas in Lake Macquarie. Uh, suburb A and suburb B, um, and they're very vulnerable to climate change impacts. And we've got over um, 40, 42 questionnaires, which is not a high number um, in terms of response rate, but that was also supplemented by other forms of research. When asked if climate change is happening, 48% of the respondents agreed it was, but 31% thought it wasn't. So we're dealing with an older population in many cases, and the demographics of the two suburbs are very different. So there's a lot of denial going on. I mean, roughly a third of the people don't think climate change is happening. Okay, how do you then move on to that next step? Um, what do you perceive as the most significant climate change impacts? Well, sea level rise is obviously recognised by about a third of those who do recognise it's being important. Flooding by about a fifth. Uh, heat wave is also high up there. When asked who'd be most affected by climate change in your area, 43% of the respondents thought that it was actually the low income groups. And it's probably a pretty good call, to be honest. Uh, it's a pretty good call around the world, I'd say, as well, in that there's very much inequity about who's most likely to be affected by climate change. And at a global scale, it's usually the people who haven't contributed to the causes of anthropogenic climate change. When asked about the barriers to climate change adaption in Lake Macquarie, uh, remembering this is one council that's at pretty much the forefront of doing something compared to other local government councils, 
A number of interviewees highlight the cyclical changes in weather and climate, and we've been talking about this over the last few days, as being natural, while others blame people for not being engaged with this issue. So you get the quotes like, our oh, storms and floods come and go, it's a natural cycle. I lived here all my life and I don't feel much difference in weather patterns now, and just a lot of people don't believe it. And we saw that, about 33% of the survey responses didn't believe it. So there's also the issue about equity and climate change adaptation at the local level. Uh, it never was, never will be fair, so what is fair anyway, and trying to identify who are the disadvantaged groups, who do we mean when we use that sort of language. So some people just you know, question that, that part of the, um, the construct to begin with. In terms of some field observations, I think they're fairly influential, fairly quite telling. Um, suburb A had few houses for sale, more newly built houses and businesses coming into the area, but it's apparent that some of the infrastructure was in the tidal range of the lake and vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Uh, it's a characterised as a popular tourist destination with unique coastal location and protected foreshores, and it's fairly clear that this particular area is going to try and do adaptation and protection around those, that existing infrastructure as a way of solving the problem. Suburb B is very different, that's why we chose the different areas. It's an area of churn the local housing market, uh, some, you know, some uh, streets get a lot of houses for sale, uh, elevation, building the houses up on stilts, and the planting of uh, local species of vegetation appear to be the main adaptation strategies that were adopted. Uh, local residents were concerned about sea rise, but one person uh, told us they were reluctant to admit it in public because of fear of losing their home values, which was identified by one resident. Uh, the train station is about two to three metres above the ground level, so uh, they recognised even without climate change, this is a low-lying area that when you started to build infrastructure quite some time ago, it's not a new train line, um, that it was actually prior to climate change they did actually start elevating the area. So now we're dealing with an issue where people may not want to talk about climate change because if they do so, they can't sell their house that costs thousands of dollars. They might be denying climate change very strategically because the cost is coming to these people and this is definitely a poor area compared to the first area. How do we actually move with that sort of scenario? So in terms of the conclusion, the models of climate change that have been put forward, that 10 metre sea level rise ecologic one, 2.5 metre sea level rise we've seen, the 1.1 metre one that was put forward by the previous IPCC, and the last one, the 80 centimetre rise, they're all important in drawing attention to the issue, but there are a number of, number of concerns I have or questions I have. They potentially cause confusion and doubt about scientific validity, and I think the point that Alistair made is really important about there is a certain degree of consensus here, where is the doubt that's at the upper level. Uh, sometimes they're too small and the impacts seem insignificant, so why should we worry about oh, one degree climate change, you know, just, you know, take off a shirt or something. Uh, too large over a long time frame and some people think it won't matter because I'll be dead anyway. So how do you engage people when that's the sort of attitude that occurs? Um, these models are uni often unidirectional and they focus on sea level rise, but what they may miss is those drainage issues, the low-lying suburbs, so it's often the areas that are behind, they don't get the views, they haven't got the wealth and the resources, they've not necessarily got an educated population. Uh, they're the people who are actually most vulnerable to some of the issues of uh, climate change, and it's because of the drainage issues, not so much the storm surge from the coast. They also overlook equity considerations around house prices for such suburbs, and people with perhaps less coping mechanisms having to deal with the brunt of the climate change adaptation. Uh, Citing of new infrastructure should take account of climate change scenarios, and it is happening, but you can see the example, that Bondi Beach example, it's a reminder of the challenges in doing so when the local government itself, according to David Shoebridge, is actually not even following their own guidelines about the beach. How do you then deal with other people say, well, I want to be on the beach, I want to get my views. Uh, plans should be made now for the eventual replacement of value, so vulnerable infrastructure, including suitable locations for rebuilding. Don't wait till you know, 20, 30 years' time. If we've got infrastructure that's vulnerable and we need to move it, think about where the next rebuilding of that should go. If we don't do it for 10, 20, 30 years' time, set aside the land, set aside this, the space to do that, otherwise it won't be there when we need it. In the worst case scenarios, compulsory acquisition may be necessary, and I know that's very contentious, and the site possibly used to protect other less vulnerable infrastructure because we actually need places in order to protect some of the other vulnerable infrastructure. So those, those areas that can be saved, part of the cost might be some of those areas where saving them, if it's possible at all, is just too expensive, it's too much to do, and there may be justification saying, well, we've got to sacrifice this little bit here in order to save all these other areas. There's <coughs> contention, I know there's a lot of equity considerations, and it should be done very carefully. In saying that, the costs of adaptation are high. I don't think there's any question about that. Should the adaptation are high, not anti. 
but the long-term costs of failure to adapt will be even higher, and I don't think that's a cost we can afford to bear. So thank you very much.